So are there questions about things we've done so far? I have a quite general question. Sure. Um, no, go for it. We'll do it while everybody's settling down. Okay. Um, so I so I wrote a bunch of CDFs and PDFs for distributions that are very specific to cognitive science. Right. And not to the general. I mean, it's they are general, but inside cognitive science. Okay. The question is, if I I would like to write them in C++ because I think they will be faster. Sure. Uh huh. But for sure, I can do overload, which is now not possible. In Writing the, the function in this stuff. Right. The question is, if so, if I write that this function, then I need to submit it to like to merge it with it. Well, you could either maintain it yourself and keep merging it with new updates and things, because we don't really have a plug and play architecture. It's one of the things we want to work on. Daniel, I just ran into Daniel Lee in the hall who said he'd be showing up, and we've had this on our like to-do list for five years now to add some way to let people plug things in. But if they're generally useful distributions and you want to code them, then we'll submit them for Stan itself. Like even if they're cognitive science specific things. Okay, so it makes sense to also add them to Yeah, the yeah, I mean if they're, you know, if they're not too crazy. Like if there's not just like one person who's using them. So we do draw the line at some level because we don't want a lot of maintenance burden with things that not many people are using. So there's like hundreds of different ODE solver function instantiations, but we're building those into external interfaces rather than building them directly into STAN because they can all be coded pretty directly in STAN, but it depends. So we'd have to talk about specifics to see whether you'd add it. So the question is like, what kind of functions will we accept to go into STAN? And we're looking for ones that are generally useful, right? There's some you know, open requests for functions of various different kinds that we'd love to see, but we're also open to suggestions of other distributions that people need, specialized kinds of functions for special applications. Generally, if the test should be, like the sanity test is, is this thing easy to dock and easy to understand and are multiple people gonna be able to use it, right? If all those things are true, we will probably accept the pull request to add it to Stan, even if it's fairly specialized. So let's go on. Any other quest general questions before we get going? So the rest of this is just gonna be more examples sort of ramping up in complexity and ability to deal with different features. When you talk about the R yeah. Sure. Sure. No, I can. I can totally do that. It's it's a top. It's a different topic. But what what we're doing with MPI is we're basically building a map operation in the map reduce sense. We're we're basically building a, a kind of map reduce operation. Although the reduce the equivalent of the reduce step often gets written up in the language itself. But basically, it's a way to take par usually parallel data and break a likelihood down into computations where the data and the computation can be done on separate cores. So what MPI does is it basically divides the data up in a way that you can apply the same function to each unit of data and get the results back as a vector, right? So that's very, so like the ODE applications we have in pharmacology are things that take like three days to run now and they're pretty embarrassingly parallelizable because they solve multiple differential equations for each patient, right? So those things with 100 cores reduce compute time down to like an hour. It's like 80 times as, as fast. Um, so that's really good, but what would happen is in general, this is very simple, but what would happen in most practice is that y would be some big vector and mu would be derived by some kind of GLM kind of update, maybe some kind of mixed effects model or something it would be pinning down on mu, right? And one of the things that we're gonna add, and Matthias is floating around here somewhere, we're actually adding some specialized GLM functions. And then Steve, who's also here, oh, Steve's actually here, and Rock and um, Eric are going to start pair, oh, there you go, I like mentioned people lock in. Um, we'll get um, parallelized versions of a lot of these things, but the idea is that we're gonna break the Y down and the mu down into, into pieces ship the data, like if y is fixed and mu is variable, ship the data off to the processors and then we only have to communicate the parameters back and forth. 
they'll do auto diff all locally in their own process, send the gradients and the result back. Okay. Right, and then that gets integrated back into the auto diff tree. It runs almost as fast. Sebastian's tested it on like 10 machines with an InfiniBand cluster with like eight cores each, or maybe it was eight machines with 10 cores each or something, something like that. So yeah, it works fine. It's, the communication cost is fairly low because we're, we're just sending parameters and, and gradients back, right? So it tends to be very embarrassingly parallelizable. We obviously, there's a granularity below which it doesn't make sense to parallelize. So it only makes sense if like Y is a really big vector here or something, right? It's not, it's not gonna take our programs that run in a second and make them run in a thousandth of a second. It's gonna take programs that take a day and make them run in 10 minutes kind of thing. Okay, let's go back to this. Oh, right, you can't see it. I've got one of these old apples that has a terrible screen burn in. I can still see the... Uh... So let's look at the custom derivative implementation. So now I'm going to take you through the actual types that we use for Autodiff. They're going to be a bit simplified. What we're using is something called a pointer to implementation here, which is a standard C++ pattern. Um, it's kind of like the resource allocation as initialization pattern here, but it's not quite because we're, we're monkeying around with memory in a way that I will describe. But basically, this is the top level variable type that Stan uses. So when we do auto diff, this is the type of argument that's passed in instead of a double. And all this var type is, is a pointer to a variable implementation, right? And what that means is that the values in the adjoint, so if we want a var and we want to take the values and adjoints of it, we have to delegate that to the implementation, right? The nice thing is there's no virtual methods here. This is not a virtual class. That means that because of the C++ memory guarantees that a var will be exactly the same size as a pointer. So if we're using eight byte pointers, this var structure will be eight bytes and it'll be efficiently copyable as a primitive right, inside of C++, right? So this is a common implementation pattern that's hard in a language like Java where you get like extra overhead in all your structures like this, or at least you used to. I don't know what's happened in recent Java. Um, so that's gonna be eight bytes on most systems, efficient to copy. Let's look at the variable implementations. These are the things that actually do the implementations of particular nodes in the expression graph. Each node in our expression graph will correspond to one of these variable implementations. This thing is just like a facade that, lets it, that makes the external interfaces to our algorithms and everything else simpler. So we don't have to be passing around raw pointers and things like that. Right, so this is a variable implementation. This is not exactly what it looks like, but it's close enough. This actually inherits from a slightly lower level class, but all the important stuff you need to know for implementation is here. In particular, it stores a value and it stores an adjoint value. The adjoint value is typically initialized to zero. If we have to compute a Jacobian with multiple passes, then it needs to be reset to zero. Um, it's got a constructor that actually constructs it out of a double value and defaults the adjoint value. And then there's this method chain. This is the method that's gonna get called on a node to do this operation, to update the adjoints of the descendant nodes with the partial times the adjoint of the parent node. That's what those chain methods are gonna do. This var i is the kind of thing that'll work for the low level roots like y and mu that don't have any operands, right? So if you instantiate this, um, it will uh, be constructed. This thing isn't implicit, so you can construct one of these with a, with a double. There's a lot of tricky bits in here. One, we are allocating this with custom arena-based memory, right? What this means is rather than doing malloc like we would typically do when you call something like new, we actually have built our own memory arena that's resizable dynamically and is fairly efficient after a bunch of optimizations that people have done so that we can go through and dynamically resize memory. But the key part here is that calling virtual functions is expensive. So the thing is, allocating this with a custom memory, 
we use an overload of operator new. C++ is super flexible, so we can actually redefine the way new, the new keyword works, the operator new works for var i, so that every time I do new on a var i or any of its subclasses, it gets allocated in our custom memory arena, right? None of these var i's are allowed to allocate their own memory. They cannot call malloc, and that means they can't use the typical RAII classes like standard vector, which implicitly call malloc on the inside. Right? Instead, we have utility methods that can deal with arrays, and we have higher level wrappers that will make this more convenient. But the direct var i implementations can only use memory from our allocators, and that's because none of their destructors are going to get called. We're going to create all these things, and then we're never going to call their destructors. We're just going to collect them all at once when we're done with Autodef. This is way, way more efficient than letting C++ try to manage all of these objects individually and have to call a million new operations and a million malloc operations. Instead, we go right into our memory arena, which keeps everything continuous, and we instantiate with placement new, if you know what that means. That's all under the hood. That's all implemented in terms of operator new, so you don't have to worry about that when you write your own var i's, right? So here's a simple example of a var i implementation. This is an implementation for the multiplication operation. Again, this is not something that you would write yourself because it's built into Stan. We use this to actually imp implement operator star or something very much like it. Um, so you'll see that it's a, we declare it as a structure and inherits publicly from the var i class. It stores both of its operands. So it's got var i stars, where it's going to store the two operands that are actually getting used for the multiplication. It's going to call the parent constructor with the value. So it's going to take the first operand's value, multiply it by the second one, and then it calls the superclass constructor, which is going to store that value. All right? Then it's going to just instantiate the two operators, store the operators. So we try to do everything with initialization rather than populating um, things in statements like that when we can. And then you see the chain method. So the constructor is actually computing and storing the value and storing the operands. And then when we get to the chain method, what we see is that Operator 1's adjoints updated with the adjoint of the result. Remember, this var i represents the result of the multiplication. So we take its adjoint and multiply it by operator 2's value. Oh, I think I actually wrote the derivatives down there for you. All right, so the derivative of a times b with respect to a is just b and vice versa. So that's why we update operand 1's adjoint with the results adjoint times oper operand two's value. <clears throat> That's just implementing those derivatives the way they need to be implemented to propagate in reverse mode autodiff. So remember what's gonna happen is we're gonna just walk down this tree in order, in reverse order in which nodes were added and call the chain method on each one of these things, right? And then when we're done, these will hold the adjoints, which are the derivatives of the final result with respect to the inputs. Right? Which again, you don't need to worry about. What you need to worry about when taking this approach to writing things is you need to worry about implementing that chain method. That's where the analytic derivatives get implemented. Right? And you see there's nowhere where we actually compute the partial ahead of time. So instead of like, computing the partials, which are just these values, we just do that lazily. Like we're not separately storing the partials somewhere, we're just storing the operands, and then in a reverse pass, we're actually calculating the, the partials. We can do that a lot of different ways. We could have stored the partials if that was easier and then used those here, all right? So now we can use that var i to actually implement a function over vars. Right? The arguments are constant reference. That call to new creates a new multiply var i. That's the argument to var, so that'll basically be the, be the var i pointer that gets stored in that var. Right? And the arguments are constant reference. It's declared inline, as Sean mentioned earlier, so that we can use it across multiple translation units when we need to in some applications. And hopefully this will actually get inlined because it's a very simple operation, right? 
so that is it'll actually get unfolded by the optimizing compiler and not cost us a, a function call delegation, right? And the arguments um, have to be two vars. So this implementation is only going to work when we multiply two parameters by each other in Stan, right? What we're going to need is we're going to need a separate implementation, separate var i implementations to deal with the var double and double var input cases. Right? Those are going to look a little simpler. They're only going to propagate one derivative. One of the operands will be a double. The other operand will be a var i. Um, symmetry means we only, of multiplication means we only need one extra var i at least for these two cases. Um, so are there questions there? That was just a lot of stuff on how the, how the basic auto diff works. So. Let's look at how Stan's multiplication operator is actually implemented. This is the variable variable case for the actual, this I actually went into Stan's code to find this. Did I, did I give you the path I hope for that? Yeah, there, it's there if you want to go look at it yourself. It doesn't include all the includes in the namespace. It's all in the Stan namespace and there's a gazillion includes. Um, but basically it's doing the same thing, but it's inheriting from a convenient superclass we have. We have the superclass opvv var i that just takes two variable operands and stores them. So you don't have to write that in every one of these functions, right? It's a class, so these things are public, but the member variables that are actually stored in that opvv are um, protected. Um, the constructor does the same thing as before. It basically stores the operands. Um, then we actually have a test here. This is a little more complicated. We go through for coherence and make sure if any of the, either of the values is not a number, all the derivatives get propagated as not a number, right? So this is done with a hint to the assembler. This thing that says unlikely around that condition tells the branch prediction code in the assembler to favor the else clause here because we're saying it's unlikely that this condition is going to be true. So this is causes the assembler to say, hey, make this my optimistic branch rather than trying to do branch prediction. We do this a lot in our low-level memory implementation. It can add like 10% to the, to the speed of something like this. Sorry, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So no, we are talking about just doubles here. Well, no, these are, these are both auto-diff variable inputs. Where, no, I don't think, no, there's not really any more templating stuff going on here. There's no template classes or anything. This is it. But there's really no, I mean, this is literally the class copied out of Stan. There's no missing templates or anything. I didn't cut any of the code out. Okay, but uh, the multiplication operators, the modern, they are, the ADL takes care of that they are the correct ones. Well, no, that actually comes in up here when you have this implementation here. So this is the implementation that takes var arguments. So if you actually pass a var argument into this function multiply, argument dependent lookup will bring in this definition of it. Because this will all be in the Stan math namespace. No, the vars are never doubles. The vars are always pointers to var i's. Which are doubles? No. Sorry, did you miss the earlier slides here? Maybe you, if you have the presentation, you might want to go back and scan through this. Right, so there's the var structure, which is a pointer to a vi. Right, and the var i pointer stores a double value, a double I'm adjoint. To, doubles. to what doubles? The ones that are shown here. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they are right. Right. So if I have a matrix, then where, where does that fit in? Oh, you don't have a matrix here. This is just a, a variable. So if you have a matrix, it's going to have, in the current way we're doing things, it's going to have one of these for each entry in the matrix. Really? So you don't actually have some matrix? That, that sounds like you, you're, not, you're not taking, you're not using What we, what we actually do is we take those matrices that have var i's inside of them 
and we strip out a double-based matrix so we can pass everything into matrix operations, do the matrix derivatives, and then put it all back together. It's not ideal. I have a design that I put up on Discourse for a completely new way to do autodiff that doesn't require this. Um, but it's fairly typical in these kinds of frameworks because it's hard to get the indexing operations to work with real matrix data types. So when I do some array stuff or matrix stuff, mm -hmm. uh, so it's always the compiler does this stripping and, and I hope you'll get a like a <coughs> operation at the end. You so do, the yeah, but you have to do that yourself in these operations. Right, you have to do that unpacking and packing in these matrix operations now. Right, it's a huge pain to implement, which is one of the things that's nice about the adjoint Jacobian approach that, um, that Ben Bales just wrote, because we can use that to sort of automate a lot of the boilerplate that we currently need. This, I'm not trying to get as far as matrices, though, today. That's, if there's another whole layer of complication there. Do you, do you want to take a stab at answering this? You don't have to answer it. No, I just like scalars, not doubles, right? right? You're saying th this is all scalars. It's not dealing with collections of matrices, yeah. Okay. That's true. Oh, OK. Yeah. If, if I can implement a function that can take an array or matrix that can vectorize, then it's all for the point of five. It's, it's what? No, I mean, I, I won't get any of the benefits then. The, Yeah. Yeah. So I use matrices and array. Right. I yeah. never use scale. Okay. So, yeah. So I think the this part will talk about how to do vectorization, but there are a lot of examples in the standard repo that right. require knowing this stuff. Yeah, I, I will get to how we vectorize density statements. Okay. Good. Right at the end, but I won't really get to how we do like Cholesky factorization and things like that, which is. More efficient than you might think, but not as efficient as it could be if we rewrote our whole auto diff package. Yeah, I, I just want to check that it's conditioned on, on the doubles. It's conditioned on scalars. It's not conditioned on doubles. So it's var i's. But then it's for doubles. So in the end, it was okay. doubles. Sure. We can, we, let's take this offline, because I think we're not like, quite communicating terminologically here. And I don't really want to get dive in for the next half hour into matrix operations, but I'm happy to talk to you after this about how all the matrix stuff works. Um, so this was the implementation of VRI. So this was how the actual multiplication operator in Stan itself worked. Um, now we're going to move on to doing the normal distribution. Um, we're going to implement this, gradually ramp up to the actual implementation of the normal distribution in Stan in case you want to add new distributions. Um, calculating uh, gradients is hard for these complicated functions. So typically I go into Wolfram Alpha, which is at like wolframalpha.com or something, and just type in the derivative I want, and then it gives me the answer. Right? This is much more convenient. We typically go and test with finite differences, too. But this is much easier than trying to derive this stuff by hand. I spent a lot of time practicing and then validating with Wolfram Alpha that finally I just trust it to do all my derivatives. So that's going to be the derivative with respect to y that we're going to need to implement an efficient version of the normal distribution. Right? So the derivative with respect to y is y minus mu over sigma squared. Or mu minus y over sigma squared is how I'm actually going to implement it. Right? It's really weird the way this unfolds, right? So here's how we can write a normal distribution with a differentiable first argument. Remember, this is the one that we were actually using in our STAN program that we showed earlier, right? This looks just like the multiplication case, only it's for a normal. It stores the double values for mu and sigma. It stores the var i pointer for y. And then it updates the adjoint exactly the same way by multiplying the, pair, the results adjoints times the partial with respect to y and updating y's adjoint with that. Right, and then when we wrap it to expose it to stan in terms of variables, we just have this new my normal and that all gets picked up on the um, arena-based allocator. All right, so this should be familiar because it's just like what multiply did. 
But as I was saying, this isn't sufficient, right? Just a small question. Sure. Uh, why is there plus equals for the adjoint? Why don't, why don't I just decide it? Oh, because you might get re-entry. Ah, yeah, so it starts at zero and it needs to grab this one and grab this one, which requires, if you're like me, like half a day of sitting down at a blackboard yeah. to validate that that does the right thing. Okay, so, great. But if you're good at calculus, it probably just makes sense at the board. So. Yeah, I work on some of these things that take me like a couple days and then I give up and then I send them to Michael Betancourt and he sends me like 15 minutes later, sends me like a page of LaTeX with all the answers. It's, it's very humbling, our team of great people at math. Um, so now remember that was the second technique I talked about. We're going to go way down to the guts, implement a var i directly. It turns out we supply a lot of helper functions to let you do this a lot more easily than just manipulating our low-level autodiff types. They're not necessarily quite as efficient as implementing low-level autodiff types, but they're still pretty efficient. Probably the overhead in copying things isn't going to be a big deal here. Right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to use this pre-computed gradient structure. It supplies this function. This is a function that will actually create a var when you know its value, when you have a standard vector of its gradients, that is the partials, and you have a vector of var of its operands. So this is working up at much higher level types. It's not even implicating any of the var i types here. Right? And here's how my normal can be implemented that way. Right? We, take the, we define the value. This is assuming that we have a pure double-based implementation of my normal somewhere, which I haven't shown you, because we need that for the double inputs anyway. Right? So I'm going to calculate that with the double implementation. I'm going to calculate the derivative according to the formula we got out of Wolfram Alpha, and then I'm going to return this pre-computed gradients thing. It has the value, right? it has the operands. Right? These are just the operands that need derivatives. And then it has the actual partials that you need. Right? So this will do the same thing as this previous implementation will do functionally. Right? It computes exactly the same gradients, propagates exactly the same gradients, because what happens is this thing creates a var where its nested var i stores the operands and stores the gradients. Right? You saw in the custom var i implementation that we didn't actually need to store the gradients, right? When we're doing multiplication, for instance, we can just grab the operands and compute the gradients later. Often, there are shared computations between computing the value of a function and computing the derivatives of a function. That's the kind of stuff that you want to store in your var i so that you don't have to recompute it when you do derivatives. Questions? Yes, sir. In the vector of what? The, the, for the second argument, yeah. the vector of bars, yeah. wouldn't that contain the same information as the third argument, the vector of gradients? No, because what the, the first argument is giving you the pointers to these structures. The second argument is giving you these partials. So these, these aren't going to have their adjoints until the chain rule gets called in the reverse pass. Well, this one for multiply, this one's going to be this one's value, and this one's going to be this one's value, so it's redundant to store them because you can get them out of the operands. Right? So that's why this can be a little less efficient. It uses a little less memory, and so it uses a little more memory in some cases. It has to pack in and out these standard vectors, which requires some allocation short term. So it's not, it's not as efficient as doing it, but it's a lot simpler than having to write your own custom var i's because you just all the calculations you're doing are at double values here. But you just need to be able to strip the values out of things like y. Um, so you apply the value, operands, and gradients. It works for any number of arguments. Right? You just pack out these, these sequences into longer standard vectors. Right? And you're good to go. Now, I've got an hour left. <laughs> Don't think this is actually going to take an hour, given the pace we're going. But now we're going up to how things, maybe we will have time to come back and talk about some of the matrix stuff and how it works. 
Um, so coding functions in C++ with operands and partials. Right, so operands and partials is this helper data structure we have that basically kind of does what it says on the tin. It stores the operands, it stores the partials, but it's written in great generality, so it actually deals with forward mode auto diff as well as reverse mode auto diff, and it uses lots of cool template expression templates on the inside so that you can actually manipulate things with their natural data types on the inside. Um, so let me show you how this all, all works. Right, so the signature that we're going to be implementing is this one. Right, so this is, this is, this is our goal. Right, we want to implement this fully templated normal LPDF. Right, you can see that we're using a different meta program here. We're using a meta program that's actually in the stand namespace so we don't have to namespace qualify it. Um, this is actually straight from this path is where you will find the implementation of Stan's normal distribution, right? And this is just taken directly out of that implementation, right? So here you'll see the template. Oh, I realize I've actually got a ton of stuff on testing after this, so we probably won't have time to get to matrices. Um, so normal LPDF, this is the signature that return type, right, is a type traits metaprogram. That just means that what it does is it calculates a type. Right, you see that colon colon type, that pull returns a type def from the return type structure. Um, it extracts the scalar types from ty, tloc, and tscale. So what's gonna happen with this implementation, if you're familiar with Stan, is that y, mu, and sigma, any one of those can be any one of integer, double, var, forward var, Right, all of our forward mode auto diff types, plus any one dimensional container, meaning one dimensional array, row vector, and vector. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities for how these Ys are instantiated, but the return type is always a single scalar. Right, so it's gonna delegate after it extracts that, so it's gonna use another meta program to extract the scalar types out of TY, which might be like standard vector of something else, and it extracts the underlying scalar type and then it delegates to boost promote args to find the final result. Yeah? What do you need to include in order to get this return type? You can go, I don't think I've pasted all the returns, but if you look at that file, there's like that many includes for all of this stuff. There's a lot of includes to get it all. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I was just wondering which ones those are relevant to return type. Oh, well, just return type. We've bro basically broken all of our structs down into, into single type, so there'll just be a return type include for return type. But there'll be a bunch of other includes that are necessary for this as well, because we're gonna, we're gonna throw down a ton of different template metaprograms, expression templates and stuff as we go along here. Right, so there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that needs to get included. Plus all the underlying log and all that stuff as well. Um, so that's just calculating the return type Right, but the idea is that those are gonna be instantiatable any old way. The first argument is prop to, oh, I think I, I think I forgot one of the arguments here. There should be another bool that says Jacobian. So there's two bool template parameters. I thought I just copied this out. Maybe I, I kind of reformatted it because it's ugly with our automatic formatting now. Um, there should be a second template article argument that says bool Jacobian. The first template parameter prop to, if that's set to true, the evaluation is going to drop all the constant terms out. It's going to automatically just figure out what the constants are and drop them out of the calculation. The Jacobian term, the Jacobian Boolean parameter is going to. Daniel, want to jump in? There, there's no Jacobian on these. There are only the Jacobians on the, the transformation components. Oh, that's why they're not controlled. Okay. Got it. Yeah, so that's a much higher, higher level. So you don't need to worry about the Jacobian. So no, I didn't make a mistake copying it. So prop two is just gonna control whether to drop terms or not, and that's gonna show up later. The rest of the template types there are for the argument types, which can be scalars or one-dimensional containers of either primitive or auto diff types. Now, I'm gonna tell you what our documentation's supposed to look like. It turns out our documentation for normal isn't quite up to my standards, but I rewrote it so it would be. 
Um, so the first line of the documentation should just be a description of the argument and what it returns if it has a return type. So this returns the log of the normal density. And it says what that actually is. It's going to be the sum of the log densities for each of the broadcasted arguments in here. Right, so that's basically, when you write a function in STAN, you have to document it. We won't, don't accept pull requests for things that aren't documented. But you really, it's not like a heavy amount of documentation. We want to document the API well enough so that somebody looking at it can tell what it does and tell how to instantiate it. Right? This doesn't have to include things about how it's implemented. It doesn't have to include things about how it gets. In fact, it shouldn't include things about how it's implemented unless there's some hint that somebody absolutely needs to know about some edge case or something. And it shouldn't be talking about how it's used otherwise. It should be a self-contained definition of what this function actually does. Um, and we're using this system called Doxygen, which requires the formatting to kind of look like this. Right? It uses HTML. It has a lot of markup. There's really good doc for it. Um, then we're going to document each of the template parameters. Right? So that's going to be the scalar type of the, well, these aren't necessarily scalar types. I wrote that doc wrong. That shouldn't be scalar type. That should be the container or scalar type. So I'll fix that in the next version. And then the parameters are also documented. So why are the random variables that we're actually evaluating, the variate outcomes? Mu are the locations and sigma is the scales. Right? You can use standard statistical terminology. You don't have to explain what all this stuff is. Assume that people reading your doc know C++. Assume they know statistics. You don't, don't write a course on these things in the documentation. Right? Light documentation, but covering what actually happens. Right? The return gets documented, right, which is just the sum of the log densities of the arguments. And then we have to document all of the exceptions that are thrown. Right? So this is basically going to throw a bunch of domain errors if you throw it illegal arguments. Right? So the arguments can't be not a number. The location arguments have to be finite and so forth. The container sizes, if you pass in containers, they all have to be the same size. Right? If any of those things don't happen, it throws an exception. These are maybe not exactly the right set of conditions here. I think we need to go through and review all this. But this is actually what's going on in the implementation. Now, this is just the beginning of the function. Steve. I, I, my, my question is just on the throwing the return type, hmm? when we throw errors, we only use domain errors when we keep yelling after the error, right? We can do the iteration model. Yes. We, so what's the dividing line there, Daniel? For it's a that's a very good question. There's some errors that actually stop Stan, and I think those are like indexing errors. Yeah, those, those are those. Right now, we treat those as kind of unrecoverable, like it's a public error, right? Like right. If, you, if your array is of size ten, you start looking for index number eleven. There's no way to recover from that, so at that point we stop. Yeah, and we I don't seg fault, but we yeah, we, don't we halt. Stop. Okay. To go on else. Oh, okay. I'll put that in the next version of this. The problem is this project's like six or seven years old, and we've done things very differently from the beginning. And now there's so much going on, it's hard to keep up in my mind exactly where everything is at. Um, so always, always, the thing to do to answer these questions is look at the code. The code always knows the answer, right? Don't trust me, don't trust Daniel. Go look at the code, make sure what we're saying is true if things don't work. Um, just looking at the code, not the comments. <laughs> yes, because comments can lie. Like, comments are dangerous. The reason I don't like comments in code very much is they get stale and they can be misleading. So I always find that when code itself is commented, that I have to actually read the code anyway to see if it does what the comments say it's going to do. Right? The code's never going to lie. So what you want to do instead of writing comments, don't write something like real z equals something 
it then requires a long comment that says z is the number of spectators at this sporting event. Just call the variable num spectators. Then you don't need the doc. Right? The doc, the code will be self-documenting that way. Break things down into functions that have reasonable names. Then you can read the code. So the goal is always readable code, not documented code. Right? Sometimes the place that you want to use comments actually in the code itself is when you're doing something that's unexpected to somebody who actually knows C++ or knows the user interfaces that you're using. Or if you have a really complicated algorithm and you want to point off to some reference materials that say, hey, we used Marsaglia's algorithm for this thing, go see this paper. Right? Or if you're using something that's very non-idiomatic. Otherwise, assume that anyone reading your code knows C++ and Stan better than you do. Do not try to explain how Stan works in your code or how C++ works in comments. Right? That's the other person's job to go learn the language, go learn Stan, something like that. Because when you start going down that road, it never stops. There's just no way to decide when we stop writing tutorial comments. So the general advice, the advice from like the Google coding style is assume your readers are totally fluent in everything. Only comment and code exceptional uses of things. So after that rant, which is um, something I do a lot, um, we have some convenience definitions up at the top of the definition, the function name, which we're going to use for error reporting, some type defs here for this partials return. This is actually going to be the return value type and the type of derivatives. Remember that this is all going to work for higher order derivatives, so we're going to need to template on the inside what our derivative types are. So this is going to look at all these types and that template types program partials return type is going to pull out what the derivative type is. So if you give me a var, that's going to return double. If you give me an f var var, it's going to return var. It's going to return whatever the derivative type thinks its scalar type is. All right? And then a couple of using statements, because we're going to use these all over the place. Um, the using statements are only allowed in functions. Then we're going to test for consistency. We have a lot of built-in vectorized consistency checking. We're going to check not a number, right? What this is going to do is check that y is not not a number, but if it is not a number, it's going to report the function name. Remember, we have the function name up here is just a char string, right? Random variable y, right? And it will report an error message if any of the elements of y are not a number. It'll tell you which element of the array it is. Similarly, we check for finiteness, we check for positiveness, um, and we check that the sizes are consistent of all of these things. Right? These are all vectorized. Um, then we're going to test for edge cases. So we're going to check if the size is zero. That is, if any of these things has size zero, if any of the containers has size zero, then the whole result's going to be zero. It's the base case for, for addition on the log scale. Then we're going to check the next thing is a little trickier. This uses another stand meta program called include sumand. Right? What this does is it uses the prop2 parameter. I think I actually wrote out what it does. Right? It's going to return true if all the arguments are constant and the proportional to prop2 template is true. So if prop2's value is true, and all these ty, t loc, t scale are only double based, then this thing's going to be true, or sorry, it's going to be false, right? Not include sum and. So include sum and means we need, we need some derivatives here. We've got some parameters, or we're not calculating uh, up to a proportion. But this means if we're calculating up to a proportion and everything's constant, we can just return zero. Um, mainly just, we could do that, but mainly um, just because these are big, heavy functions, right? So it tends, tends not to be as big an impact when there's a ton of other stuff going on. But it would be interesting to see. Like, this is the kind of stuff that if people want to get involved in the project and you want to go, like, test this stuff and figure out whether that would help or not, that would be great. Right, so like we we would love to know these kinds of things, but we're doing lots of these kinds of tests inside like the check sizes and all that stuff. So it's probably not going to make that much of a difference because there's a lot of conditionals 
that are implicit in all of these functions. So these are going to have like conditionals for every one of the, you know, every one of the entries. So it's probably not going to make that much of a difference. So when you're thinking about optimizing, you really want to see where the bottlenecks are. Largely, we're using a lot of intuition here. It's really hard to profile code under optimizers and actually see what's really happening because the optimizer sort of gets in and the instrumentation of the profiler gets in and tends to distort the results you're getting. So we tend to need to do our own instrumentation. We're not quite micro benchmark because those are too tricky with things getting compiled, like something in between to check whether we really get efficiency gains. Okay, now we're gonna actually construct the operands and partials type. This is basically a builder pattern, right, in the C++ sense. Like what a builder pattern does is it basically constructs an object, lets you modify that object by setting things on it, and then when you're done, it has a way to extract the final value you want. Right, this is a pattern that's often used for initialization so you can make things constant, for instance. Here we just use it because we want to be able to operate on this thing and then when we're done, we need the right auto diff type when, when everything comes out. Right? So operands and partials is going to get, the class is going to get instantiated with template parameters for all the arguments, y, mu, and sigma. We could make this simpler with some kind of factory pattern, but it's not that bad as it is. Right? This again follows an RAII pattern. All the allocation just happens. You don't need to worry about any memory for this. It just sits on the stack. And, deals with itself the right way. And it provides expression template views of all the values and derivatives. I'll go through and show you what that means next. Right? It's constructed with the types of arguments. So, so that's going to be the main thing. Into which, so that's going to store all the operands, because you're giving it y, mu, and sigma. It's going to store all the operands when you get that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to pump in all the derivatives. We're going to tell it what all the gradients are that we need. But we're going to do it very carefully so the result is very efficient. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, and we did this in many stages, like Daniel and I were building up all of this stuff, and we started with very crude implementations, and then basically Andrew wouldn't let us do the first release until it was faster than bugs on the rats example, which is like a really easy to fit, really conjugate model that took us like another three or four months of vectorization, which led to a lot of this code in order to be faster than the simplest bugs example. Right? We really built Stan to be fast for hard problems, not to necessarily be super fast for small problems and easy problems, but we've also got the compilation overhead, which kind of makes us not so useful for quick, very quick iterations. Um, so what we're going to do, this is a standard template programming pattern in C++. We're going to provide expression template views of variables. That is, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap a class around something and that class is going to provide an interface that lets us use a heterogeneous type of things as if they were uniform. In particular, what's going to happen here with scalar sequence view is it's going to provide expression template views which provide broadcasting. So broadcasting is the technical term for what happens when you're vectorizing and you have a scalar and a vector and you need to copy that scalar basically to the same length as the vector. We're not actually going to do those copies. Instead, we're going to use the really clever C++ technique of expression templates. Expression templates are one of the reasons why C++ has the only other decent matrix library than Fortran. Right? There's only two decent matrix libraries. There's like Eigen in C++, and then there's like BLAST and LAPAC in Fortran. Right? Those are like great matrix libraries, but there's not a good matrix library in C and Java written in these languages. All these other languages just import one of the other things, like TensorFlow imports Eigen, R imports LAPAC, Python imports LAPAC. Right? Only two good matrix implementations out there right now. And it's because, the reason C++ lets you do this, it's because of expression templates. This is why C++ can write efficient matrix operations. It was a real breakthrough in the mid-90s by a guy named Todd Veldhusen, who sort of ushered in the, the modern era of C++ programming, if that even isn't an oxymoron. Um, so the expression templates are going to provide broadcasting. So what they're going to implement, scalar sequence of you, is going to implement operator brackets. So in other words, we're going to be able to access yvec, elements of yvec, using brackets. Right? It's going to be specialized. So we're going to take this template type, and we're going to specialize it for scalars, arrays, vectors, and row vectors. 
right? So that what it does is for a container, that is an array, a vector, or a row vector, it returns the appropriate element, that is this operator brackets, returns the appropriate element of the container, but if it's a scalar, it just returns the scalar for every n. It doesn't matter what n you give it, it just returns the scalar. So what this is doing is it's providing a way to wrap containers and wrap scalars so they both look like containers, but there's no copying involved. Right? Everything just holds a reference to the thing. So it's a very light way of making something that's heterogeneous data types look homogeneous from an interface point of view. Okay, we're also gonna store the number of elements in the containers or one, right? It's gonna be one of those two things because if there are containers, they all have to be the same size. If there aren't containers, the overall size is one. So that's just a heavily overloaded function to compute that. Uh, so this means that if I want to vectorize also over matrices for, for some reasons, yeah. then I just would like me to extend the, the scalar sec view yeah. And I would get a vectorization over matrices. I think it already is extended to matrices. I think it actually works for matrices already. We just don't want to implement normal that way. Right? We thought it would be too confusing to have like a row vector, a matrix, and have to like broadcast the rows or broadcast the columns. So we, we, we just eliminated that. We had long discussions about whether we should, but in other cases, I think we are using scalar sequence views for those. If not, it would be an easy extension okay, inside exactly. of here. Um, then what we're gonna use, this is, this is a builder view. So it's like the view. So the thing is these views, the Y, the mu and the sigma are already set. These are giving you immutable views of the actual values, right? What these vector builders are going to do is they're going to give you ways of building up new values. The first argument is going to indicate whether it allocates any memory at all. If the first argument is false, there isn't gonna be any memory allocated by this thing, all right? So these are gonna be modifiable views. The type that we actually get is gonna be determined by promotion. So we're gonna look at all the things that we actually take in, right? And that's going to be, it's going to give us the appropriate types on the inside of Vector Builder, right? So we're doing the T partials return and the T scale here to get our inverse sigma. I'm not sure we actually need that T partials return there. It looks like we do it everywhere. I'm not even sure what that does. Um, I guess that's gonna instantiate whether we need the partials for that object or not. I don't know if you remember what that does, Sean. Now, Sean, Sean was the latest person to refactor this code, um, or maybe Daniel was, I don't know. I haven't, anyway. So do it like this. Right, so that first thing you'll see on the second one, the include summand, that's just a meta program that evaluates to true or false. Right, so that's, gonna, that's going to evaluate to false if T scale is just, so that is if the type of the scale parameter sigma is just a primitive, then this vector builder isn't gonna build anything. Because this vector builder is gonna be used for intermediate values, but if Sigma is not something that's a parameter that we don't actually need to calculate log sigma. We're just gonna drop it because it's a constant, right? So we're only gonna allocate this log sigma thing if we need it, otherwise it's just gonna be a dummy to allow things to compile, right? But otherwise, this is gonna be the kind of thing that we can set, All right? Include some and, yeah, I guess I said that, the length. Right, so it provides a length that should be called size. I hate methods called length because it's ambiguous between Euclidean length or other kinds of length and size. So let's use size instead of length for these things. Um, apparently we used length here instead in our metaprograms. So, right, the T partials return type. So this works for double and all of the auto diff types. Right, so the nice thing about all this abstraction is when you're done, it works everywhere. Um, so let's see how we actually use those vector builders. So remember inverse sigma, right, and log sigma. It turns out we're gonna need inverse sigma even if sigma's not, uh, even if sigma's a constant because it shows up actually in the terms with mu and y, right? So what's gonna happen is we're gonna iterate over the length of sigma. 
So we're only going to do this loop as many times as the length of sigma. Everything else is going to be broadcast the same way the views are broadcast. So the nice part about this is if sigma is a scalar and y or mu are vectors, we only ever calculate log sigma once. And we only ever calculate 1 over sigma once. Value of is another overloaded function. Right, so these vector builders are overloaded. So inverse sigma i may be fronting a scalar, in which case it's just going to be set once, and this loop's just going to happen once. Um, so setting i sets the scalar, it sets the ith element of the container. Log sigma only ever gets computed once if sigma's a scalar, and the value of returns the double-based value of any stand type. So this is the way of going for like, so if you want to get the double values out of a matrix, for instance, a matrix of ours, you can apply value of, and that returns the densely packed matrix. It requires allocation and copying, but usually that's not a bottleneck because that's just quadratic, and usually all the operations are cubic, so it's usually not a bottleneck doing that copying. Um, right, so the first thing is always calculated because we always need inverse sigma, and the second one is calculated only if sigma is an auto diff variable. Right, and the versions of log and operator division that's used for one over value of sigma there. So the thing is value of may be pulling out different kinds of values here. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop over the total size of things and compute all the values and necessary intermediate. So the first things we calculated are the things that are only necessary conditionally. Like we only need log sigma if sigma is not a constant. We're going to need all this stuff if we need to compute it all. Right? We would have already exited. If, ev if everything was a double, we would have already exited the algorithm. Right? So we know at least some of these things aren't a double at this point. So we can just go ahead and eagerly calculate them. Right? So we're going to take the return type is going to be the values of the y vector and the mu vector. So those are going to pull out the underlying values. If they're auto diff types, it's going to pull out one less type. If they're var auto diff types, it's going to pull out a double. Um, and then we only do the computations once and then reuse them, right? So it's really important in writing this code that you don't recompute, in basically any code, that you don't recompute shared subexpressions. So what we're doing, and the thing is, we can't rely on the compiler to necessarily do this because these are going to be instantiated with complicated auto diff types. So we want to make sure that this y minus mu over sigma only gets calculated once, right? So we only calculate that thing once. And remember, inverse sigma only gets calculated once if sigma is a scalar, and then it's going to get reused here because inverse sigma is one of these views that we have. Right, so this is going to be y minus mu over sigma, which is a term we need to actually evaluate the log density. It's going to be this one, right, y minus mu divided by sigma. So we're looking at that term there for y minus mu over sigma. And then we're going to square it to get that term there and the density. Right, but we reuse this y minus mu over sigma because if we were to repeat that, the compiler is not clever enough to figure out our auto diff types can all be unfolded, and it would duplicate work. Rather than creating one of these shared objects on the auto diff stack, it would create two different copies of it. Right? So it's important in your stand code as well as in your C code to not recompute. It seems like you guys probably went through a lot of iterations to find out how to break these individual pieces out. Is that a valid statement to make? I, mean, um, I think it's pretty obvious once you look at it. Right, that's why I wrote the derivatives. I wrote the terms the way I did and showed that there's a constant term, there's one that just involves sigma, and there's one that involves y, mu, and sigma. So it's usually pretty easy when you look at the log density. It's a bunch of terms, and you just need to look at which parameters are involved in each term, and look at things that are scalars versus not, and either, you know, and wrap them up the right way. So usually it's pretty easy to tell by inspection. I, I don't think we've ever had a problem with that. In fact, we knew we wanted to do it, which is what led us to, to building this stuff in, in the first place. All right, so it uses the same T partials return type for both the values and the derivatives. So we're going to use some of this stuff. So that's the type of the final value of the nested value. So like if we're dealing with vars, 
this T partial return type is going to be double because that's the type of the value and it's the type of the adjoint. Right? Then we can just drop constants in whereby they're close to where they're used. We somehow forgot the const, the static here, so that, that should be fixed. Um, and then we compute the value. Right? So here we're gonna, if we include sum and prop two, that means that's only gonna be true if we're not computing up to a proportion. If we're computing up to a proportion, that negative log square root two pi. Luckily, it's right in our code, so that's what the term should have been when I messed it up earlier. Gets added, right? But we only add that if we're calculating the full density and not dropping constants. Then we minus equal log sigma, but again, we only do that if the scale parameter is not constant. Otherwise, we just drop that term, and then we have that negative half times y minus mu over sigma squared that we calculated before, which we pretty much always include. We really didn't need that if, because if that if is false, we would have exited out of the function earlier. So this is actually computing the value. So log p is the thing that we're actually allocated much earlier, and we're now incrementing it with the value. Right? We initialized it to zero way up at the top, and now we're incrementing it with all the terms. So these are the three terms that were broken down when you wrote the density down. Right. Yep. Okay. I guess I said all that. I'm, I'm still not getting used to the way this, this reveal works here. I guess I should just go through these. And... Okay. So now we're going to calculate the partial derivatives right, of everything. Because remember, we need to calculate the value, so that's what we just did. Now we're going to calculate all these partials, and we're going to use the nice facilities and operands and partials to let us do that all with very natural types. Right, so we're gonna, we have again this t partials return. This is our scale diff, inverse sigma times y minus mu over sigma. That's gonna show up in the derivatives for the scale term. We've got the if not constant structure ty, right? We're gonna take this minus equal the scale difference. So again, it's gonna be all minus equal and plus equal operations because it's gonna get initialized to zero, but you might be adding to the partials because the partials might consist of a bunch of terms. So they're mutable and the way to access them with is plus equal and minus equal. So we're saying that the partials for edge one, which is our first argument, so edge one corresponds to y, so we had y, mu, and sigma. That's the name inside of operands and partials. It grabs the partial structure and lets you, again, it gives you a view of those partials that you can update. Right? So that's just going to be that scale difference. The derivative with respect to the location parameter is just negative. The derivative, you could jump it into Wolfram Alpha, but it's also easy to see by inspection. And then there's a complicated derivative with respect to the scale parameter, if we need that, that gets updated in operands and partials. That's it, though. Now we do the build and return, right? And it knows what to do. So this build method takes as argument the final value that you computed and knows how to return the appropriate auto diff type. It's all specialized so that if the whole thing's double, it just returns a double. If it's a var based, it's going to return a var. If it's higher order auto diff based, it's going to return one of the higher order auto diff types. Right, so this is, the, this is the flip side of the builder pattern. So the builder patterns always look like allocate, modify. So the modifications to the builders are here. You see the operands and partials. Here's the log P. But the operands and partials are the things that are modifying the builder pattern. We constructed the, build, the operands and partials with the operands, and then we go through an update with the partials. We drop that all out, and then we're done. Right. So this is again calculated by a meta program in here. You can see what the type is. Everything is declared inside the stand namespace. You need a bunch of includes. Um, then what you need to do is based on the path of the file, right? You need to actually to get this to all work and be picked up by our high level includes. You need to find the lowest level high level include above the code you added and add the include. So we dropped this in stand math prim scale prob normal LPDF. So in this file, stand math prim scalar.hpp, we add this. The thing is, this all sits inside of scalar, 
even though it works for vectors and matrices because none of the code depends on any scalar code. That all comes in by the specializations of operands and partials and all the, all the views and ever, all the other metaprograms. So you only just need to include this and then it will get picked up externally when somebody includes the Stan library in any way it gets included, they'll get normal LPDF here. Right, so this gets propagated up to all the external includes in the language. So good, we got probably enough time to get through the next two parts. How to add a function to the Stan language. Right, well we need to add it to the symbol table. So wherever you installed Stan or unpacked Stan, there's a directory source Stan language function signatures. And in there, there's a declaration that says basically here are the vector types. These are the types that are valid arguments. Now we're going into the, we just worked in the math library. Now we're going into the Stan repo. And what we need to do is we basically need to tell the symbol table, right, that we have some new functions, right? And it's gonna use the classes and utilities in our abstract syntax tree to do that, but it's all wrapped up here. So vector types is just a collection of all the legal arguments to our vectorized types here. Um, and it uses the AST types and other types that you may need for functions can be constructed out of, out of the pieces in ways that you can see here. And you can see in this function signatures is very easy to understand and copy the patterns that you see. So what we need here is we need to loop over all those vector types because any of our arguments, right, the y, the mu, and the sigma can be any of those vector types. So this is basically adding like 125 type specifications for the different ways that our vectorized normal can be instantiated. So we just go through the loop. This will all be easier with C++ 11. I just showed you the way. Well, I cheated over here, but this should be for each loops. Um, so the helper function add takes the name of the function the return type, which is just a double type here, because these are the stand types. You don't need to worry about vars or anything like that. Everything's under the hood and stand for that. This is just the equivalent of real. Um, and then the argument types for i, j, and k. So that's going to be the y type, the mu type, and the sigma type, which can be any of these vectors. Um, and as a side effect of calling add, it adds these signatures, that is the, the return type and the argument types and the name of the function to the set of valid stand functions, right? Other than testing, that's all that you need to do to add a function to stand. That's like, that's how our density functions are built. And following that pattern, you can add a new density function. The other thing is like a fun project, if you thought you understood that or want to dive in and make sure you do, there's a bunch of densities we have written where we weren't particularly careful about only having one value of like log sigma and things like that. So there's some cleanup that needs to be done to speed up a bunch of our existing distributions. There's an issue for that. Um, so testing, everybody's favorite part. I saved it for last hoping that we would run out of time, but no. It's actually, actually very important. Um, before you can submit a pull request, we require testing. So we require the doc, we require the implementation, we require testing. So it must be unit tested. Every function added to the language has to be instantiated in the stand model. So we want to actually test that it will work end to end. If you try to use this new function in the stand model, it will actually be able to compile. We used to have lots of problems where that wouldn't happen. For all the possible signatures, um, like there's 125 signatures for this, so I'm not gonna do normal LPDF as an example here because there's like 125 lines. It's all boilerplate, but it's a pain. Instead, I, I just picked an arbitrary function. The two argument arc tangent was, had clean tests that I could show you. So ATN2 is a built-in C++ library function because you don't wanna divide. You can get a lot of loss of precision in that division. Where take, doing arc tangent with the argument separately, you can be much more precise. A lot of cases of functions like this in Stan, a lot of opportunity to add more functions like this because by breaking apart the arguments, you can make things a lot more arithmetically stable. So another example of this is like log 1p. All it does is evaluate log 1 plus x, but when x is really tiny, 1 plus x rounds off to 1, whereas log 1p x, when x is really tiny, can return the right value. So you see a lot of these kinds of compound functions that are added either for efficiency or for arithmetic stability or often for both in the stand context. 
Um, this is just a convenient example. The structure is simple, like multiply. But the thing is, we've built multiply into our higher order framework test, where I'm going to just show you a direct test of a function like multiply. Then I'll show you how we actually test the, uh, well, I probably won't. I think I just have pointers to how we test the distributions. Um, so here's what the unit tests look like. So Sean gave you the outline of what this is going to look like. We're importing the big reverse scalar HPP, which means we're bringing in basically all the scalar autodiff stuff, right? But we want, so we'll bring in basically this, this, and this, right? Because it's reverse scalar, so it'll bring in all those types, but it won't bring in forward mixed array or matrix stuff. Just some stuff, just some utilities to help us with the tests. Um, and this is a reverse mode unit test. This is where you'll actually find this in the stand code. Um, the name has to end in test CPP underscore test dot CPP in order to be picked up by the test harness. Not exactly sure if the underscore is necessary. Um, and includes the top level header and some utilities for testing, which I already said. Here's what they actually look like. Here's one of the tests for ATN2 for two variable inputs. Right, we've got utilities, AVAR, AVAR, things like that. These are utilities that are defined up at the top. That's an auto diff variable, so you just don't have to type stan colon math, colon colon math, colon colon var, right? And then we're gonna evaluate. So we set the values A, B, we calculate the A tangent, and we calculate that that's equal to the double value. So that A tan 2, 1.2, 3.9, that's calling the library version of this. That's calling the double version. Again, this all depends on argument dependent lookup. First A tan 2 will call the stand math version. Second one will just call the standard library version. Then we create a vector out of A and B. We create a vector for the return. And now we create a gradient of x with respect to g. Right? So what we're doing is we're taking f as our result, we're computing the gradient with respect to a and b, and we're returning the result as a standard vector. And we're just checking what the results are. We had analytic results for what those derivatives should be. So that's testing that the derivatives, so the thing on the left is the value you're expecting, and the thing on the right is what we got. Right, so that G0 holds the derivative with respect to A of F, and G1 holds the derivative of F with respect to B. We know what those values are, and we test them explicitly. Right. So we need to do this, though, for the double var and the var double instantiations. Remember, I only saw, showed you the var var instantiations of this stuff. Right, so we also have a little test framework here that tests all the not a number behavior. So you just basically create a little embedded functor and it goes through and tests all the arguments that they do the right thing, but they propagate not a number in the right way. Just copy this if you have a, have a function or you can go read how that template type actually works. So we have that test not a number utility that takes in that, that functor. Um, right, so this ATN2 is just defining that functor and then throwing it into that test, right? So it's defining an instance of it. Right, and then there's a final test, some stuff that Daniel added later to make sure we don't have memory leaks. So we basically take a couple arguments and we test them in a bunch of different ways, instantiating with variables, double vars, var double. And these tests are just gonna make sure that these things don't leak variable instantiations on the stack, which we've run into bugs with before. Um, then we can run the unit tests. So we run the tests the same way Sean had them down. We just have the path to the test and it'll show it actually. I alighted a lot of stuff in the middle here. There'll be a huge spew of make if you haven't made everything first. And there's a lot of extra reports that I chopped out. But what you're looking for is it saying passed on the bottom. Then you know it's actually working. Right, unit testing the distributions is a lot trickier. There's a testing framework built into, it's actually easier in some ways. There's a testing framework built in that generate, that code generates multiple instantiations. It checks for errors, it checks for values, and it works for reverse, forward, and mixed auto diff types. Um, and you'll see an example of that in math test prob normal, normal test. Um, you plug in legal and illegal values and it tests all the possible combinations of them. Um, I'm not going to actually show you how that looks because it's fairly big and I figured we'd be running out of time about now. I guess I was estimating right. 
So CPP lint tests, those are tested in both directories, both in STAN and MATH, to see that there are lint mistakes, like things aren't declared, um, you know, that unary constructors are not declared implicit, things like that, other, other sort of semantic tests. Um, and we have to do those. And we want to make sure there are zero errors. If you submit code to continuous integration that has lint errors, it'll just get booted out right away. It's no big deal, but it'll just save you round trips. Doxygen will make all the docs, but it requires that you actually install the Doxygen um, toolkit to actually generate the docs. That's instructions on how to do that. That's part on all of our developer doc process stuff. Um, and you want to make sure there are no errors. Again, if there are errors generated by Doxygen, then the pull request is going to get booted. Right? We want to run header tests. These tests make sure, and again, both math and STAN, they make sure that all the includes are complete, that every file is including what it needs to include itself. Um, and it has to be the same test in math library and STAN, because Daniel set them up pretty consistently. Then we want to do model instantiation tests. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a model, and we're going to provide in that model every possible instantiation of ATAN2. Right? So we can, if we just have data, we can have either a data integer or a data real, and we could test all four possible instantiations of ATAN2. Right? Here we're just like testing the library, um, so it's really not a big deal. But for your own functions, you need to do this. Right? And these have to be under the directory stand source test, test models good, and those all get tested under continuous integration. Right? And you have to test all the data instantiations first, and then you can test the parameter instantiation. So we declare a parameter, and then we test all the additional possible instantiations that we haven't already tested. So there's basically eight possible instantiations. I think we need, if I did it right, five there. And yeah, I probably copied one somewhere that I didn't need. Maybe I'm adding wrong. Oh, no, we don't need the double one. It's complicated math. I think I got them all. But anyway, you want all the possible permutations here of all these things just to make sure that you've written your function generally enough in the li math library that it can be instantiated through STAN. Right? And this tests the parameter instantiations that come along with things. Running the model instantiation tests, um, the way I typically work is I typically try to, try to compile those model instantiation tests from command stand. I think there might be a way to do it from the make, but it wasn't easily documented and I don't read make very easily. You can test all that, you can test that all the models we have work by doing the make test integration compile models. There's probably a way to test individual models, but I don't know what it is. Maybe I'll ask Daniel later to fill me in if there's a way to do it. This is done automatically. Usually we let the continuous integration server do this because it takes a long time to get through all this stuff. Um, and you have to just make sure they all compile. 10 minutes to spare. Whew. Okay. So I think we have time for questions or for everybody to fall down exhausted because it's day one and early in the morning. So if people want to run, I won't be like embarrassed and you won't insult me, but I'm happy to sit around and answer questions. Yep. Uh, if I must be develop a beta plan distribution, for example, <clears throat> uh, what approach would you take? Would you refactor like like there is different beta, there is the binomial beta, there is different beta function already. Uh-huh. I I'm not sure beta prime, I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. Uh, very similar to that time, but it has some more flexibility or something somewhere. Well, it has the tail uh, or uh, bad tail. Okay. So right. it's related to common distribution. Okay. And uh, what I saw, you have the gamma uh, right. on the repository. So if it can be made out of compound pieces. Um, you might be able to implement it using other things. But generally for efficiency, for every distribution, you want to go through and implement it basically the way I just showed you. Um, because that's the way that's going to make sure you don't do any redundant work anywhere. Yeah. So 
and it makes sure it's implemented for all the vectorization things, which is trying to do that directly is pretty much impossible because there's hundreds of instantiations. Yeah, because there's like multiple ways of implementing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would, it would be nice, but gen when you actually look at this, it's not actually that much code. It was really hard to explain, but like the normal is really only like that much code. It's not like a huge pile of code, and there's not many places in there where there's opportunities for reusability because of all the templating that goes on with sub-expression. So maybe you could reuse some code. It would be interesting if somebody could figure out, like maybe we could have some utilities that were reusable. You can certainly reuse all the math functions and the library functions and things like that inside. So you definitely don't want to write the beta function yourself or something like that. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, there, there's, I think if you do that, you'll find there's very little opportunity for sharing code among those things. But if you do try it and figure out there is a way to share code, we'd like to hear about it. Because basically, we've just implemented each one completely independently. Like the inverse gamma and gamma don't share any code. Right, the beta and the beta, like we just implemented a beta with a mean total count parameterization. Right, which is what we actually tend to use, but that didn't just, we could have just had it delegate to the other beta, but that would be inefficient because it has a bunch of, bunch of arithmetic operations and you can actually you know, make the gamma functions easier because you've already got the sum and things like that. So, so we tend to try to implement everything directly just to avoid the extra overhead of having to do the auto diff arithmetic and then delegate. But that's certainly a valid way to do it. So one of the things we also tend to do is get things working and tested, even if they're not the most efficient way to implement it, and then worry about efficiency later. Right? We really want to get the stuff working much more than we want to have it be maximally efficient. Right? Which is why it's possible to even start with like a purely templated version of this that just delegates to other things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they, not for efficiency, but for arithmetic stability. Right, okay. I just wondered, has there been any or much thought put into getting the parts to pick up when they should sort of be substituted in? I think that's a question for Sean. <laughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> um, I, I, just, I just wondered if there'd been much thought in, put into getting the parts to pick up when these functions like log 1 p should, should go in instead of uh, the, the, the more obvious solution for those that haven't. I'm not fully familiar with every possible function. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shaw's been bugging us to do this ever since day one. He's like, why aren't we doing like people optimizations in the AST? The reason we don't do that a lot is our AST structure is really awkward. It's some super, it's like uses variant types. It's all tied into the boost spirit chi thing. So it uses variant types everywhere. Whenever there's a, a grammar rule that says it can be this or this or this, or like a statement, it can be like an ODE solve, or it can be a function call, it can be a literal. Right? All those things get represented as variant types, as boost variant types in C++, which is like insanely clever, like the rest of boost. It gives you runtime type checking on all these variants. It's super efficient, but it is a pain in the ass to write because what you have to do if you want to write a function that operates on type A or B and produces a C is you need to write a function that operates on A and a function that operates on B and it's all got to be in this functor, this very specific functor form with like headers and it requires a huge amount of code duplication to do that. So we'd like to figure out how to do all that stuff better. Is that get easier with lenses? No, it's the, it's the variant type thing that's a problem. Because you need to actually give it a functor. And a lambda doesn't convert to a functor. Well, you need to, it, needs to be, it needs to be a functor with a method for each one of the, oh. with each one of the types. So it actually, you know, each one of those could be defined with a lambda, but like, it's not. There's some slick thing that you can do in some team. Um, so where you can like make a bunch of little lambdas and smush them together to a visitor. That oh, cool. Okay, that, that might make it easier for us if we, if we get up to there. But 
I think we're going to change the way we do this to just use S expressions specifically to make these kinds of optimizations a lot easier. There's a lot of things we'd like to do like that. Yeah. Um, if you're interested, I'm <coughs> often playing around with different ideas for writing the compiler differently. Um, and we're sometimes talking with Matthias and I guess Alan and Korea and Bob. And, uh, so Yeah, we just kicked off the STAN3 project. We're going to completely rewrite the parser and actually update the language. There's sort of a partial spec in Maria Goranova's master's thesis on Slick STAN, and we've sort of been working on the specs on discourse for that. So the ball's in Matthias's court, who we just hired, who's our programming language theory person to make sure all the proofs in Maria's system sort of work for what we're going to do, but then we're going to roll out a whole new language that'll be like... But I think work can be done earlier than waiting on Matthias for that. Yes, work. absolutely. Um, like the, because it will be mostly backwards compatible, maybe entirely. So, yeah. Um, <coughs> we just need to write a new stand two compiler or whatever we choose. Um, so I'm messing with that. Yeah. And we're like playing around with doing it in no camel rather than doing it in C. So we'll have like a real simple pattern matching language with like all the nice features that people who like programming languages <laughs> like, including me. Uh, Once Sean figures out the portability issues, <laughs> then, then we'll be sold and, and pull the trigger on this. But anyway, are there other, other questions? Yeah. What's the best way to learn some of the um, C++ template metaprogramming techniques that you I use? really, there's a book um, that I really like by Vandenberg. And Josudis, and I have not got the, they have a, this is the one to read if you are a computer scientist. It's written for computer scientists, so I love this. It's just like exactly in my language. They have a version for C11 that just came out, which I haven't read, which would be the thing to get. Um, there's also a book by Alexandrescu, which it hasn't been updated, which is much more practical. You really, when I did this, I read these two things, plus a lot of like stuff I found online. Um, but they, both these books are great. This is much more like bottom-up case study oriented, and this is much more like top-down computer science-y style. But this is the only one updated for C++ 11. There's a lot of good blog posts that you just know the name of the thing that you're confused about, which I often don't. So. Yeah, that's the hard part. <laughs> Once you learn an acronym like ADL, then you can go find a million tutorials on it. Yeah. Right? But until then, you don't know what it is. Yeah. So it's. I was going to say also, but I have a little Myers Myers. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. So that that's yeah. I should have put this. Scott Myers. Is there an E in it? I can never remember. I think it's. I don't know. Maybe there's an E in that. <laughs> Um, and it's a book, there's an effective, he, he writes a lot of books and he has a lot of good case studies on YouTube. He gets invited to around to a lot of conferences. Um, and he's got like this great Prince Valiant haircut too. It's like really cool. <laughs> I'm always in awe of people who still have hair. Um, so, but his books are really good. This, these are more introductory and they're not aimed exclusively at template metaprogramming but they do contain some stuff on it. Some generally like how to organize C++ and a, you know, sort of patterns to use for it. To, it'll go through the common patterns like RAII and argument dependent lookup and all that stuff. Um, I really, really like Josh Block's effective Java book too. I don't do Java anymore. That's like one of my favorite books in a programming language. So you've already asked a question. Let's go back up. Yeah, I want to ask, like, uh, because there's a lot of difference between uh, reverse how to leave and forward how to leave. Because you said something about, like, uh, then you get second order and how to Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can briefly outline it here. Um, the Wikipedia also goes over it. Um, our autodiff paper really does it. So forward mode gives you an efficient way to compute derivatives for a function from R into Rn. And reverse gives you an efficient way to compute gradients. 
right? In forward mode, computing the derivatives of n values with respect to a single input is a constant operation. In reverse mode, it's the other way around, right? So gradients are efficient in reverse mode, right? Forward mode is actually much, much more efficient to code because it doesn't have any memory implications. You basically just propagate derivatives forward as you go, right? It's very easy. You, instead of, instead of the adjoints holding the derivative with respect to the result, each intermediate value holds the derivative with respect to the single input. And those are easy to update with like calculus textbook rules stuff. The trick is, is if you, these are both first order, right? This is, this is for us, this is var and f var of double. Right. Those are both first order derivatives. For second order derivatives, what you do is you nest a var inside of f var. So the idea is you go through and calculate this, and then you take the gradient here. Right? So you do forward mode auto diff here. You get a bunch of results, each of which has a gradient with respect to this. And then you apply reverse mode auto diff inside of that on the gradient result. So you calculate the gradient using forward mode, or sorry, you calculate the tangents, as they're called, using forward mode. Then you propagate reverse mode backwards, which gives you one row of the Hessian. And then you do it n times, and you get the whole Hessian matrix of second derivatives. There's also specialized stuff for like gradient vector products and things like Hessian vector products. And we've even got like gradient of trace of Hessian times a matrix done quadratically because you need it for higher order stuff. The way to go through and see how all this stuff works in Stan is we have a bunch of directories called functor. And those hold functions in them like gradient. So if you find like a grade, just do a find find gradient.hpp, there's two implementations of it, one using forward double and one using var, right? And there's also hessian.hpp, and those will show you the basic calling patterns for doing all of this, right? And we tend to use these functionals, which I haven't told you about, which take a functor as an argument and then return the derivatives with respect to that functor. When you go up to our algorithms, everything's abstracted away from this like low-level detail stuff. So sorry, that's a very quick sketch, but like it's like a couple lectures to get through forward and reverse mode auto diff properly. The Wikipedia articles are very good at it now, though. Is it lunch? Yes. Uh, so there's an announcement. If you need a receipt for the tutorials, there's a piece of paper that the front of me that you can put your name and email on, and they'll let you make one. Does anyone want this? No one. Cool. I think somebody was nodding yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Well, you can just leave it up here and like people oh, yeah. can find it if they want when they. It's here. Yeah, feel free to leave if people. I said I'd stick around and keep answering questions, but please, if you want to go to lunch, go to lunch. I'm, like, I don't know what. The, does anybody know what the lunch plans are? <laughs> okay. I guess we'll go out and find. Feel free to like. I'm going to be here the rest of the. I'm going to be performing all week. <laughs> feel free to ask uh, ask questions later.